The question really is, are the buildings just going to continue to deteriorate until they just demolish and fall apart on their own, or is somebody going to do something? The restoration took uh, 24 months. It was a two-year construction project because there are 70 separate buildings. Well, first of all, this property was going to foreclosure, and it is very likely that if we didn't intercede, someone else would have bought these properties at auction. It is very likely that the vast majority of our tenants would have had to leave their apartments permanently. Uh, we made the promise that all tenants who wanted to stay could return and that their rents would not increase upon their return. Properties like Clinton Avenue Apartments and most of what home leasing does, it's not just an apartment, but it's an affordable apartment. And so tenants are usually entering the best apartment they've ever lived in at maybe the best rent that they've ever had. So it changes their lives, not uh, just because of quality housing, but also affordability. In my experience in upstate New York, all the communities that have suffered over the last several decades from disinvestment are coming back, and they're always coming back on the basis of historic preservation. When I walk into the new cap rep space, I'm kind of amazed because it's better than what I imagined. It was a bakery originally with tall ceilings and, and huge beams and huge columns, wooden columns. To have the flavor of that still exist, yet to sit in the space I'm sitting in, which is a theater that is immersive. It, 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 you, you can't help but go, wow, a, a play here is going to get your attention and keep it. And to have all that together in one building is lovely. This building could easily have been demolished um, the UPH building could easily have been demolished because that it had actually imploded and its roof had collapsed. But you could never replace what that building was. You could never replace its relationship to the light, its, its windows. Um, this building's materials were irreplaceable. And if we could celebrate what we did so well 150 years ago or 170 years ago, at the same time as we celebrate a, new, a rebirth of the purpose of these properties, that's to me a sustainable economic development. So really, it's the heart of our mission that these properties represent. We like to say that we like our buildings to feel like the community's living rooms, open to all, and open for the kinds of conversations that might be difficult for any of our communities to have. Uh, when I walk into this beautiful space, I feel like I'm stepping back in time. This is our, our culinary and event center. We have our uh, hospitality management, uh, culinary and event management uh, programs offered here. Uh, so it's primarily classroom and uh, space and lab space for culinary. The historic renovation architect was thrilled 
to find the original blueprints in the time capsule, which was buried in the far corner of the building over here behind me through those glass doors and off in the corner. After serving as the historic public library for a hundred years, uh, it's now being used as an educational facility once again. It, it's, come, it's come home to its roots. Uh, so much imagery here regarding the history of, of the building and the area and the college. Uh, and it, it kind of comes full circle uh, right here in this building. Recent events and events all my life point to the importance of remembering and honoring our history. Uh, and this is a physical uh, manifestation of remembering and, and honoring our history, which is, which is so important to today and, and to all our futures. You know, it's wonderful to come inside and see the people using the spaces who live here and enjoying um, and taking pride in the, the building. There are three buildings. We've created 28 apartments, plus eight art studios, and commercial space on the first floor of the two buildings that are connected on Lake Street. In this building, there is especially wonderful window trim and a lot of nice features that we were able to maintain and celebrate. We have skylights that were used in bedroom spaces that I think make the building very unique. Of course, the wooden floors and the brick. I think people really love seeing all those details. I'm really proud of creating space that people said, this isn't market rate space. That's a fun comment to hear because I think everybody should have the opportunity to live in beautiful space. I think fundamental to being a good historic preservationist is to follow your curiosity and to follow it wherever it leads. One of the things I think that Arch has brought to the Adirondacks over the last 30 years is to really raise people's awareness about the beauty and the importance of its architecture and have brought a greater sense of stewardship among the people that live here. We saw very early on that we wanted to change people's hearts and minds and the only way to really change people's hearts and minds was to educate them, was to shine a light on things and the only really way to do that was through, was through education and so I can see that we have elevated this sense of appreciation and interest and stewardship in the region's built environment that makes preservation work going forward much more likely and possible. I'm very interested, we're very interested in the stories that buildings have to tell, in the history that, that buildings connect us to, but I'm way more interested in what buildings can do for the vitality of, the com of a community today and going forward. That's what the possibility is for thousands of buildings across the region, including this one, bringing life, bringing vitality back to Adirondack communities. Believe in and love the place where you live. A lot of the work we've been doing is to teach people that they're already preservationists, they just didn't know it. 
PBN has really reshaped how we look at preservation from an equity and justice lens that's really become the way that we measure and value the work that we're doing. Not just are we making more landmarks, are we protecting more buildings, but are we expanding how we tell the story of Buffalo and Western New York? Are we protecting places that were previously vulnerable? Are we making sure that everyone's story is being told and the places that everyone values are the ones that we're protecting? We also hope that the movement will really embrace this idea of anti-racism, will really embrace the tenets of inclusivity and of access. And we do see a lot of movement uh, in preservation towards that. And we hope that organizations like Preservation Buffalo Niagara and other organizations across the country that are really committed to this work can be models for other organizations. We love new development. We just want to make sure that the places that people already love, that are already special and important, are part of that new Buffalo. We want a bright, vibrant future. And in order for that to happen, we really need to understand how we've gotten to the place where we are. And we really need to make sure that everyone feels at home, that everyone feels welcome and supported in this place so that we can get to that future place together. This is a very iconic building at the centre of this small hamlet of Waylandsburg. Everyone who lives in the area drives by frequently. They know the building. The building is owned by the Waylandsburg Grange Association, which is, which is actually just across the street. We're sort of thinking about it as a, as a centre of craft activity. Um, but also as a community centre and centre of activities uh, and broader than that as well. It's just really magical because it's the product of collective volunteer work and so there's a tremendous sense of pride and accomplishment in the whole building and to have people to walk from one end of the, to the other, to have folks at work from the blacksmith to the woodworking shop. Um, it's just, it's really fantastic transformation. Winning this award from the from the Preservation League and the prestige that that brings with it will help get the word out, will help inspire others with this, with, with, with this vision of what's, um, of what's possible and the, and the tremendous, tremendous benefits that come, that come with it. Historic preservation is critical to our mission. It's so rewarding coming into the building. 50 years ago, our board actually considered tearing down the building. It had been closed from the 70s through the 90s. Seeing this now, like it was as close to we could get it to 1911 is just, is great. And seeing the building used, especially for so many different things, is particularly rewarding. Greenwood's purpose is to tell stories and to preserve history. A building like this, built by Warren and Wetmore, who did Grand Central Station, many other buildings, very important to keep. Thinking that this building could ever have been torn, torn down in the 70s is it's unthinkable. It's a beautiful structure in a, in a beautiful setting and it's part of Greenwood's history, now a New York City landmark, and we're proud to preserve it. Our future is not safe if we don't remember what happened in the past and that goes for buildings, that goes for everything.
there's never a day where I don't have a sense of the transcendent when I walk through our sanctuary or when I stand on our rooftop and I look at that bell tower and hear those bells. And I believe that uh, that use of the space has created uh, a sense of purpose and meaning for many people. It's inspired us to continue to rebuild our congregation. This building was originally built in 1922 by John D. Rockefeller Jr. One of the distinguishing features of the building at the beginning was the bell tower that Rockefeller built, and he installed a carolin of 53 bells, which had been the largest in the world at the time. But when the Baptist congregation moved up to Riverside, Rockefeller had the bells removed as well. So this bell tower stood empty for nearly 90 years but over the last 15 years, we've been seeking to rebuild our congregation. Preservation is uh, core to who we are as a church and what we're trying to accomplish. So as we seek to rebuild the congregation, we needed to rebuild this beautiful sanctuary. Now that this facade has been uh, restored and the stained glass windows have been completely renovated and we took down the bell tower stone by stone, repaired the, the steel inside and then rebuilt it completely and put in a new carolin of 50 bells in the bell tower. We have uh, restored this building to its original grandeur and it's a, a source of inspiration, I think, not only to our congregation but also to the neighborhood. We, as the current individuals here on Earth now, have the opportunity to preserve and promote the past so that it has a future for the next generations who come after us. I started the page back in 2012 when I got my first iPhone. Uh, I downloaded the Instagram account and I started to go out and take pictures of things that I love, which basically is the city in which I live. A lot of the times when I do a story on a house that's unoccupied or abandoned, I get a lot of people asking me why, why is it like this, what happened here? And the answers are all in our past policies, which had an impact on the most marginalized members of our society. And so the page actually ties in the accurate history of what has occurred over time in our community. I think the page gives us, the residents, a sense of pride and purpose um, in the community that these buildings, these homes are not just things of the past, but that they are still existing, that we have an opportunity to change things for the better. I love what I do, and I love that others love what I do, so it keeps me going. <laughs>